Welcome everyone to Buddha's Center. It's so wonderful to be here tonight. We're going to talk about Lama Tsongkhapa's foundation of all good qualities, the source of all my good, begging for a mountain of blessings. And what an incredible text that shows us all of the stages that we'll need to go through uh, if we haven't already uh, in order to become fully enlightened, uh, in order to become a Buddha who has just perfect wisdom, perfect love and compassion, perfect skillful means, perfect power, and has this ability to help everyone while uh, abiding in a state of bliss uh, that we've never even experienced, uh, you know, a countlessness of. So it's pretty Im impressive that uh, we're presented with such a clear path. Uh, and not only do we have, you know, the ability to hear it, uh, but we have teachers all around us who are willing to explain it. Uh, so just because there's a clear path there, uh, if we don't have access to it uh, and we don't participate in it and we don't uh, have teachers around us teaching us this, then even if it's in the world, it doesn't really help us in the extreme way. I mean, we're talking about extreme help. If we're talking about being able to be completely enlightenment, uh, completely free of suffering, in a state of complete bliss, in a state of omniscience, where one is the most reliable guide in the universe, the pure protector, the pure teacher, the one who's gone to bliss. I mean, this is what we're talking about being able to achieve. And that's something that's just outstanding and out of this world. And we have an opportunity tonight to look at that text that shows us, like I said, if we haven't gone through them already, what stages we need to go through. And it allows us to be honest with ourselves to see if we've really had the realizations that we think that we've had. If we don't have the mirror of the Dharma and we don't have something to kind of show us what a realization would look like, show us what a foundational practice would look like, then we wouldn't be able to be clear on whether or not our mind has achieved kind of a mental basis that'll be necessary for the next steps. But luckily, because we have all of these instructions, we have all these incredible texts and all of these incredible teachers who show us exactly what we're looking for, we have the ability really to tame our own minds, tame our own minds in dependence upon the taming instructions. Uh, and there's all of these stages of abandonment abandonment of the negativities of our mind that we have to go through. And we won't be able to get rid of the more subtle states of negativity that are present, you know, even in the highly, highly realized beings that present prevent them from being the most reliable guides uh, in the universe. Uh, we won't be able to put any kind of dent in the course afflictions and the kind of coarse things that keep us from being able to really hear teachings well, to be able to analyze teachings well, to be able to meditate uh, well. Uh, so it's important for us to really use the mirror of the Dharma to see where we're at and apply the necessary antidotes to the mind that we presently have. The mind that we want to have, we lead these kind of imprints in and we make these aspirations you know, may I be able to work for all sentient beings. I'll take on myself this task of freeing each and every sentient being. We leave these kind of imprints in our mind that become the mental basis that become the kind of conditions that allow for the arisal uh, of a mind that would actually want to day and night work for others and put others' needs uh, before one's own. But without knowing exactly you know, what that mind would look like by definition uh, and what its prerequisites would, would need when we look in terms of the mental basis and Pension Sun Andrapa's general meaning of perfection. It talks about a mental basis and a physical basis that one needs to develop bodhicitta. And the mental basis that's required uh, is very big. It's not something that most of us naturally walk around with. But what's amazing is that all of us naturally walk around with the potential for its arisal. 
and we have states of mind that are kind of like it, that we just need to ripen more. We need to mature more and make the little bits of compassion that we have into bigger and bigger and bigger bits of compassion with more and more object, referent objects of that compassion, meaning sentient beings. Uh, and then eventually through this maturation, through this growing that can take place, uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to actually generate this mind that aspires to enlightenment. That's the only mind that is called the entrance into the Mahayana. It's the only thing that has the fuel, that has the power, that has the bomb strength to get rid of when combined with the wisdom realizing emptiness, the obstructions to omniscience. Uh, without this mind, one is able to achieve an abiding nirvana. One just has a desire to definitely emerge day and night from cyclic existence. Uh, and then couples that with the wisdom realizing emptiness. One can achieve an abiding nirvana, but he or she has not only achieved, not achieved their own highest potential, but they really aren't of benefit to others in the way that an omniscient being can be. It's, it's still a being who's working within a conventional reality that appears to inherently exist because the obstructions to omniscience keep him or her from truly seeing reality through the lens of, of the ultimate reality uh, and simultaneously be able to apprehend the conventional truth that you and I are apprehending. And then my own particular conventional truth that I'm apprehending uh, is going to require a real specific set of antidotes and tactics and kind of sometimes tomfoolery, I think the Buddhists engage in, in order for me to, to ripen. Uh, and it's just the way that it is that, you know, there's a wrench for every nut. There's a, a Buddha uh, you know, realizing what we need personally uh, at every moment um, and then trying to do something about those needs that we have. And because the maturation takes so long, it's subtle things that are maybe happening. Uh, if we haven't been presented with the Dharma and we don't have, you know, this potential that we have at this very moment, um, but when we start to rev it up and we start to create more conditions within our mind by being immersed in the Dharma, by really making the Dharma a part of our lives, it activates more of the kind of conditions for those teachers that we had in our previous lives who were emanations to emanate again, because we're thinking about their holy words. We're thinking about the instructions that they left us. And this is the, you know, the Dharma, the wisdom Dharmakaya in some ways in action, presenting these things within our own mind that we remember from our teachers that allow us to mature. Uh, so it's really amazing that we have tools to learn how to mature that work and that a system that was presented 2,600 years ago that works and that people are achieving states of realization in bodies like ours right now and did before and generations before that. There were people who were able to apply these teachings uh, and have great results that I've even personally witnessed in terms of behaviors that are so unlike others in terms of holy actions uh, that it makes me know that there's some sort of maturation either you know that is taken place in that individual in that life or an expression of how he or she matured with a personalized touch for what I need to see. And I think that that's what's so amazing uh, about the potential we have is that we have helpers uh, if we allow ourselves to be open and we allow ourselves to study uh, and analyze these teachings, it opens up a lot of other karmic potentials for help. Uh, so before I say anything more about that, uh, I'd, I'd like to just bring all sentient beings here as we always do and share with them, you know, this gift of the Dharma so that they can hear what they need to hear uh, in their own individual languages in order to mature. And that's what we're talking about being able to do. And that's what the Buddhas are doing for us personally right now. Like I said, they're working for our own individualized needs and we have our own individualized generic images in our mind 
uh, and we believe things around us have higher values than other things around us that, that someone else who walks in the room wouldn't assign the same values and wouldn't, you know, maybe be as attached to something or hate something or, you know, whatever it is, take your pick of what those in own, everybody's own individual madness could be, as uh, again, Hopkins used to say, you know, we have our own individual madness and, uh, you know, everybody's misapprehending th and life, if everyone's who they appear to be <laughs> and not a Buddha, everyone's misapprehending things and crazy because we're mistaken all the time in terms of everything that we think about, look at, think about ourselves. There's just a big mistake going on. And then that mistake personalizes more mistakes. And then we have, you know, from this mistake, we have all these karmas that are jumping up that are then giving us our own personalized mistaken world that we believe is the world that we believe is what my world must be like your world and what I like must be like what you like. And now there's bifurcation of self and other. And now when you don't behave the way that I think you should behave, then this bothers my mind because I think everyone sees the world the way that I do. And the Buddhas recognize that that's just not true. And the Buddhas individualize our treatment plan. And we see how Buddha Shakyamuni made individualized treatment plans for everyone and had this set of medications that he gave out as he saw problems that these medications would work for in order to be able to get to the big problem or the couple big problems if you're wanting to be a Buddha, which are the self-grasping ignorance that makes us mistaken about everything that we've personalized. And then the self-cherishing attitude that makes us think that we're the most important one in the universe and we can prove it because I think so. And that's all it requires. And this is why the practices of seven point cause and effect and equalizing and exchanging self with others can change that. We can convince ourselves of something that's accurate. We can change that. So with that in mind, and knowing that every single sentient being has the same nature that can be changed, that now is misapprehending things. Uh, if these beings who we're calling here are who they appear to be, you know, if there are realms left and I'm not the only sentient being, chances are you all have suffering in your life uh, and have things that you don't have the capacity to do uh, because of this reason or that. And, you know, we hit walls day and night. We want to help people. We want to, you know, be able to do what we think will be best. But then once again, we want to help people. We want to do what will be best. But I have my own world that I'm apprehending as real because I think it is, because I think so. And because if I think that things aren't inherently, if I think that things don't inherently exist, and I think that cherishing others is more important than cherishing myself, then that'll become true for my mind because I think so. <laughs> so it's about maturing the way that we think. And this process of bringing sentient beings here and trying to share the Dharma with them is saying to ourselves that I can do so much better than I'm doing right now. I could do so much better that I could actually be of benefit to everyone in the universe while going from bliss to bliss to bliss to bliss. And this is a reality that through logic and reason can be presented. So this is what we're inviting sentient beings to hear. And as we invite them, first let's get into the seven point Vairakana posture. We've gone over this many times so that when we invite them, 
we're inspiring because it says that the seven point Vairocana posture is an inspiring posture for others to see. So when we get into this posture first, and then we invite all sentient beings to be our guests, they see this posture and then they get into that seven point Vairocana posture. Just imagine that as I'm saying this prayer that all hell hungry ghost animal, humans, demigods and gods, however you think of the universe, however you think of that universe, as many beings as you can think of, and, and don't be shy, you know, think of those ones that you know first, and then don't be shy to add on those beings you've heard described. And just imagine that you've brought them somewhere to hear this in their language. And, and, and they'll, not only when it says their language, their uh, personal affinity, like I just talked about, we have our own personal misapprehensions and our own personal world that's real and what we think is what matters and what, you know, we're the, the last say in all of it because we think so and it's mistaken. And we have all these karmas and so forth that are bringing us to various objects to be attached to and, you know, various objects to want away from us. And we have our own personalized misapprehension going on all of the time. So that's why we need our own personalized recipe and our own personalized treatment plan. And let's imagine that when we bring these beings here, that we're not only bringing them here to hear this Dharma, the way that we're thinking of it in our own way about what we need, because we think that the world is the way that we think the world is, but think that our minds are able to, because of omniscience, we're imagining this, we're laying these tracks are able to know the generic images in all of these beings' minds. So their language is not only the language of their like English, Spanish, Tibetan, you know, not like only that, but their own heart language or their own, you know, whatever it is that drives them at that moment that says, I know it's this, I know I'm that. And I know that this isn't this and this isn't that. Whatever their own personal language is for their own characterized mistaken identity, imagine that you're able to know what that problem is exactly. Not only, not just, oh, they have self-grasping ignorance and they cherish themselves more than others, but you have this pharmacy, as Guy Newland talks about, at your disposal. And you imagine you're an omniscient being that's able to emanate bodies to use these medications in the language of all beings. So you're able to speak to them in their language, but in their own individual capacities. So I think it's important when we say this to always get a deeper and deeper feeling of it. And I think today, I think there's a different richness, if you agree from the if, if you think about it in that way, about our own, all of our own individual personalized mistaken world. And I think that my own individualized mistaken world is the right world. And you do too. And then when we don't agree, I have a problem with that because you aren't seeing things the way the world is. Why? Because I think so. And that's how I create my own world through a mistaken lens of my own personalized mess of karma and afflictions that you don't have. You don't have the same karma and the same afflictions popping up like popcorn in your being as I do. So your thinking and your world is not like my world. It can't be. It could, we could have similar concepts and stuff, but the nuances of it are just so unique. So imagine you're the being, the teacher, the Sugata, the protector, the reliable guide. Why are you reliable? because you're omniscient and you're going to send a body out to do a personalized treatment plan and execute it because you know exactly what eventually all needs to be executed and you can gauge where that being is at in terms of objects of abandonment of their mind that have to be abandoned to, to achieve what you, going back to you're not a Buddha, you would settle nothing for nothing less, perfect bliss and perfect reliability. So now you're back to imagining that you're a Buddha and able to bring all of these beings here in the language of the gods, Nakas and Yaksas.
in the language of demons and of humans too, in however many kinds of speech there may be, I shall proclaim the Dharma in the language of all. And normally we do these rituals where we get rid of demons. And here we're saying, bring the demons, bring the hindrances, bring those spirits who want to harm, bring them so that I can tame them in their languages, in their heart languages, in their mistaken affinity identities. Wow, it's so powerful when we think about what a Buddha could do and what real compassion could look looks like. We want to relieve beings of suffering. We want beings to be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. Imagine being able to relieve them in such a way that was real, that wasn't just giving them more of the suffering of change because you know their individualized treatment plan because you, and I've made this concept up right now, you know their individualized treatment plan uh, because you're omniscient and can see all of the imprints that are there, that are about to come up and that are going to keep you, keep those rocks in the road for you to not be able to get to the realization of emptiness. And moving those rocks, moving the right rocks, get rid of the self-cherishing attitude. So just imagine you just are really, really individualizing the moving of the rocks so that everyone can get to that point that you wouldn't settle for anything less than and imagine that you've achieved it. And, and so we're all in the seven point Virakana posture. Now, all sentient beings have been brought here. And let's just try to calm our minds down a little bit. Let's, uh, in this seven point Virakana posture, we've did this many times before, but tonight I think it's good. To, it's always good to refresh techniques. And when we talk about this meditation, we start with body posture. Uh, so the seven point Virakana posture, we get into that. Uh, and this is really the most conducive posture, it says, to being able to have a clarity of mind. And then it, once we get into this posture, we can assess our mind and see if we have that there. Uh, so we can say, all right, if there's not clarity of mind, I need to apply various antidotes to that lack of clarity, um, whether it's an excited problem or kind of a sleepy problem. We can use this kind of first setting as an assessment to make sure that we can move forward in a successful way in our meditation. So the seven point Virakana posture puts all of the channels and the winds and our blood flows in, in a way that's very natural uh, and then doesn't become a hindrance physically to our wish or to be able to eventually achieve calm abiding united with special insight. Uh, and and that that is somewhere that's a ways <laughs> in the distance, like you know, like a mirage for me in some ways. Uh, but I know that based on my what I've shown my mind so far, uh, that it is not uh, something that's not achievable. It's something that I will achieve if I put the effort in. So we get into the seven point fire kind of posture and now we'll talk about the focal object. Uh, so we're just gonna tonight uh, do breathing in, breathing out and counting the breath. Okay, so breathing in, bringing the breath all the way to the top of the breath. And when we breathe in all the way, uh, our stomach should be going out. Uh, so this is the way that we can offer our body the most oxygen. And this is the way that the yogis breathe. Uh, so we want to make sure that when we inhale and we fill our lung and our diaphragm, we just we give it as much space as we possibly can. Our tummy should be going out. And then when we exhale, our stomach goes in and collapses. And usually we breathe, we breathe in, in the opposite way. Uh, and we have to train ourselves in meditation to breathe in the proper way. Uh, so here's a chance to exercise, uh, our techniques. And that's all that we're trying to do is learn techniques that we can then use on a daily basis to exercise with, or to kind of enhance our own practice, uh, or just to get our minds calmer so we can hear the teaching so that I can give the teaching so that you can hear the teaching without the problem of the three pots that we've gone over so many times. Uh, so 
The focal object's gonna be breathing in, filling the lungs and diaphragm. And I'm not saying focus so much on all of this filling the lungs and dry diaphragm, just focusing on the breathing in and breathing out. But you're going to have to get to the technique, you know, so you have to be checking to see if you're breathing right, which is a distraction, obviously, for what your aim is. Uh, but you'll be able to then just naturally breathe like that if you don't already. And, and when you exhale and you feel your stomach go in, you count one. And then you do rounds of this. Then you breathe in, exhale, and count two. And you hear a lot of instructions that say if you lose track of your count uh, or if there's any fumbling that you should start over with your count. Um, I think that this can become discouraging uh, for beginners and that this can cause you not to want to practice because you lay tracks in your mind that you, I can't do this. Um, so it's not saying, you know, don't get to the point where, you know, you can do that. But if you're just beginning, don't be so hard on yourself, I guess, is the thing. Um, our minds are so distracted and we've not really told them what to do very much. So when we just suddenly decide, hey, I think it'd be a good idea if I told my mind what to do, um, don't be so hasty. Uh, and if you get too hasty and you make it like a boot camp, what can happen is, is you'll get really used to lethargy um, because your body will just go into a kind of a default sleep mode. Um, and that's really kind of dangerous too. So take your time with the, with the calm abiding meditation, but make sure that you do it on a daily basis and it'll really help you to be able to eventually achieve a, a state of calmness of the mind where you've calmed all external you know, the sense consciousness, and now you're abiding, calm, abiding, so you've calmed the external sense consciousness, and you're abiding on an on object, an internal object with the mental consciousness. You're not engaging with sense consciousness. Uh, so this is where eventually you get to a point where you have bliss, and this calm abiding allows you to sit on your chosen object of observation without moving for four hours or 24 hours, whatever you wish, uh, you'll have this mental and physical pliancy mixed with bliss. Uh, that would be wonderful if if we could have that, would it not? I mean, it'd be so wonderful. And may we all achieve the state of calm abiding, which will be necessary for us to have if we want to see emptiness. There's no way to see emptiness without calm abiding, without being able to get our minds to do what I just said. And uh, this is where it begins. And then there's a lot of meditations. Obviously, you can build upon this. There's incredible teachings in Action Tantra. I understand on how to, not that I understand, that I understand there are, uh, but I think it's good to, in Action Tantra, there are these meditations that can help with calm abiding. But as beginners, it's really kind of self-deception if we don't start from a place to really assess our minds at a most basic level. Uh, so the focal object is going to be breathing in and out and the counting. Uh, and what we're going to look out for is to make sure that there's no laxity, you know, that our mind's not sinking, not getting sleepy. It all kind of falls under the category, laxity, lethargy, dullness, sleepiness, all of this is uh, under this category of laxity. Uh, we want to make sure that our mind's not sinking or getting tired or sleepy. And then on the other side, we want to make sure that it's not busy, that it's think it's not moving off of breathing in and out and counting. So uh, let's begin. Uh, uh, so, oh, and then the antidote. Uh, so if, for instance, your mind is doing it, either of those things you don't want it to, it's doing something other than focusing only on uh, something other than focusing on the breathing in and out and the counting. If your mind's doing either of those things I just mentioned, then you're going to apply the antidote. What's the antidote? The antidote of mindfulness and introspection. The introspection is the spy in the mind that while you're sitting here breathing in and out and counting is making sure your mind isn't sleeping. <laughs> it's a spy. It's not a loud thing that's just there going, what are you doing? It's a spy. It's quiet. It's behind the scenes, making sure that you're not getting sleepy, making sure that you're not busy in your mind. Uh, and if the spy catches the... Uh, crook stealing your potential really that's what's happening if you're not you know letting your mind meditate right there's a crook stealing your potential uh then mindfulness grabs the object back and says this is what i'm not supposed to forget uh, so this is what we'll do we'll do this for i don't know 
uh, 30 seconds or so, you know, probably, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 rounds of breath. And then uh, we'll go from there. Okay. So breathing in and out and counting. We're so fortunate to be here this evening. We have this life of leisure. We have the opportunity to practice these teachings. Not only are they in this world, we have access to them. We have access to all of these qualified teachers that can show us the instructions that Buddha Shakyamuni came to give us 2,600 years ago. He was so kind to turn the wheel of Dharma three times and give all of those teachings all of those amazing, amazing teachings that will allow us to achieve complete Buddhahood, just like he did, where we have no more afflictive obstructions or obstructions to omniscience. We're so fortunate. Let us set our motivation now in this calm state of mind that we're doing this, we're listening to this teaching, we've brought all sentient beings here, We've engaged in everything that we've done so far in order to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. We recognize the need to become a Buddha and want to become a Buddha because we've practiced the seven point cause and effect for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment and equalizing and exchanging self with others. Imagine that those practices that we do over and over and over again fully, fully ripened, and each and every one of us, all sentient beings surrounding you, say, may I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Now with this in mind, let's start to imagine the merit field. We're imagining the merit field is coming here and we're supplicating them to give us the Mahayana teachings, supplicating them to be able to come and connect with us in our lives through their words and their books and to help us enhance our understandings in the most subtle ways that we couldn't even imagine. Imagine Buddha Shakyamuni appears in the space in front of you, beautiful and radiant, golden color, naturally this color. Imagining His Holiness the Dalai Lama sitting on a jeweled throne supported by snow lions, a Vajra throne, a throne that will remain until samsara is empty and there's no longer any beings, even abiding in Ogmin, learning from, our, from, the, from the Buddha's Sambhukaya, from the Buddha's enjoyment body. Imagining Kensa Geshe Wandak Rinpoche, imagining Geshe Lobsan Gompo, imagining Demolocha Rinpoche, Kensa Lobsan Jatso, imagining Geshe Doji Damdula, Umzala Geshe Aga, imagining Um Geshe Mala Tenzin Ladran, imagining Jeffrey Hopkins, imagining Lama Zopa Rinpoche, all these beings that you consider holy, any being that you just consider an enlightened being, imagine them in the space in front of you. So many beings have come to this world in so many disguises in order to help us. 
any of those beings that you feel might have come as that disguise, just rejoice in the fact that the Buddhas are working in your life. Imagine the beings of the extensive deeds lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Maitreya and Asanga and Basu Bandhu and Dignaga and Dharmakirti and Vimukta Sena, Haribhadra and Shakya Prabha and Guna Prabha, Lama Sulimpa, Lord Atisha, Drone Tompa. Imagine the beings of the lineage of profound view passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Manjushri and Nagarjuna and Buddha Palita and Arya Deva and Chandrakirti, Shanti Deva. Baba Vega, Shandarashita, imagining Lama Salimpa, imagining Lord Atisha, Drontompa, the lineage of blessings beings from Vajradhara to Saraha Matripa to Lonaro, Lodsawa Marpa, J. Milarepa, J. Gompopa. All of these beings were so fortunate they came to this world to show us the nature of our minds. Imagining the Drontompas passing down the Lam Rim lineage the householder Drone Tompa, never underestimate your ability to become enlightened, to become a holy being. You have to look at Milarepa. You have to look at Lotsawa Marpa. You have to look at Drone Tompa and see that these beings were householders and they decided that the Dharma was what was the most important thing and that everything else was just part of their own mistaken identity. the three old Kadampa lineages, imagining the holy beings of Tibet, the Padmasambhava, the lineages of Tibet, Padmasambhava, the Nyingma tradition, imagining Rapjan Lonchempa, imagining Mipam, imagining all of these holy beings of the, the, of the Nyingma lineage, imagining the Sakya lineage, Sakya Konja Nimpo, Sakya Pandita, Sakya Randawa, imagining all the beings of the Kaju lineage, Jay Gampopa, that incredible jeweled ornament of liberation, all the Karmapas, the beings of the Galupa lineage, Lama Tsongkhapa Kirtup Jai Jel Subjai, Basu Chuji Jetson, Janja Rupi Dorje, Gonchu Jimmy Wampo, Jet Sumpa, Babajo, Penchen Sun Andrapa, all of these holy beings, Jayan Sheba, Seven Dalai Lama, highest yoga tantra deities, yoga tantra deities, performance tantra deities, action tantra deities. All of the Buddhas, of the 35 Buddhas, imagine they're assembling in the space in front of you, just like Lama Tsongkhapa was able to have them do as he called upon them. Imagine they're right here with you, looking to your eyes with so much love, so much respect for you. They came to this world to try to make you figure out how to get rid of self-grasping ignorance and self-cherishing attitude. And here you are today actually doing it. Just imagine there's a bliss that overcomes this merit field. And all of the protector deities we considered in the space in front of us, just immense loving kindness that they've shown us over so many lives and we're finally listening to their advice. Imagine that we all become so happy about this. Imagine that we and the, all the sentient beings that we've brought here become confident and just recognize that this suffering that disturbs my mind so much isn't necessary. And these lack of blissful states of my mind aren't necessary. And my unreliability isn't necessary. And imagine all sentient beings just exhale, just with a sigh of relief. And then imagine that with that exhale, a bliss overcomes uh, us all and a happiness, the most happiness that we could ever have had in our lives. We have reference to imagine we experience it right now because we know We've, we've just got this nectar that we can drink if we choose to. And all the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas, those enlightened beings are all just so full of bliss because of the fact that we're doing exactly what they, what they care about. And that's making our way to their state. So now that all the beings are here, let's read uh, the Heart Sutra. And imagine now that We've brought all sentient beings. We've somehow managed to, you know, if we look at the king of prayers, it talks about, you know, putting, a, you know, an entire Buddha field in an atom. So if you can do this or the space is filled with, you know, Buddhas as many as atoms, uh, then we can imagine that sentient beings can fit 
on Vulture Peak Mountain somehow or another with our imagination. For anybody who's been there, it's not a huge space, uh, but imagine that we're bringing all sentient beings there in this kind of special way uh, that we can through this visualization where we're able to bring them to this place, bring their minds to this place, like we're bringing our minds to this place and imagine that it's big enough because we could all sit there on atoms. Uh, or or on the north of an atom, you on one side and me on the south of the atom. You see how many we can get there. <laughs> Somebody can sit in north, south, or northeast, I'd rather, et cetera, et cetera. So we're imagining that sentient beings can pile in to the Vulture Peak Mountain. And we're imagining in our mind that Buddha Shakyamuni is there and just so ready you know, just sitting there so ready to give the this final view. It's the second turning of the wheel, 100 years after, I mean, uh, it, one year after, supposedly, Buddha achieves enlightenment. A year after, he's been wandering, teach the Four Noble Truths, and he's wandering around talking to people. And then he's in Vulture Peak Mountain. And imagine we're all there. And then he blesses Shariputra and Chen Rezig's mind to become like ventriloquist dolls. And he goes into the samadhi that expresses the dharma called profound illumination. And he's blessed these, the minds of these beings to engage in a play, engage in this discussion, this kind of marionettes, these puppets are engaging in this discussion that presents what it is that's wrong. What it is at the end of the day that's wrong, that's making everything around us appear wrong. There's one thing doing it. And then things that shoot out of it, you know, attachment and, you know, and there's a self-cherishing attitude that runs kind of alongside it. But there's something very specific, explicitly taught in this Heart Sutra, and that's the object of negation. That's the thing that we have to negate about everything that we believe about self of person and self of phenomena. We have to negate something about everything that we don't, we already, it's like something that doesn't exist, we think exists in everything that exists. And that's how all of, we get into so much trouble because then we, if things exist from their own side, then they're valuable or not valuable, really, really not valuable. And it's this assignment of inherent existence to everything that is the object of negation in terms of the explicit teaching of this Heart Sutra. What is the emptiness? Form is empty. Form is empty of inherent existence. Every form we see we think has inherent existence and stands on its own, on its own side. You know, it's standing, it's existing in, in time on its own. Time is inherently there. The thing, the microphone is existing in time and space, sitting in it, inherently there. And the space it's sitting in is inherently there. Wow. So this Heart Sutra comes to tell us, Buddha came to tell us in this at Vulture Peak Mountain that no, it's your misapprehension, you're grasping at things as being inherently existent that starts your inappropriate thinking. This conceptuality that's all wrong and then says this is pleasant, this is unpleasant. And then based on this kind of determination this discrimination, you feel a certain way. You discriminate it and then you feel somehow about this object you've made inappropriate attention about, <gasps> thought about wrong. You feel a certain way. You know, the way you feel is coming from wrong. So your feelings wrong. And then you become attached to things you like and you push away things you don't like and you have pride because you inherently exist and you think you're more important than someone else because there's self and then there's other and you're you and you start with this 
from this kind of self-grasping ignorance comes the attachment to self and mind. And then as soon as you have that, there's this, as soon as there's this mind, and then you have other, well, if you have self-cherishing attitude, then everything about my day is about mine. And the Buddha came to say, that's your big problem. And that everything that you do from there is keeping you in cyclic existence. So, and then in, 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 in so explicitly, I think I said it wrong implicitly before, explicitly it talks about emptiness and implicitly we see the full pathway of the, the bodhisattva presented in there of the path of accumulation, preparation, seeing meditation and no more learning. We see this whole pathway presented in there, but really you require a, 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 someone to give you a commentary to see the five paths inside of this at each breaking point. We can do that sometime. Uh, but with that being said, let's think about this for one moment and get our minds back to where we were at, that all sentient beings are now with us at Vulture Peak Mountain. The Buddha's there, Buddha Shakyamuni is there. Chen Rezig, Chariputra, there. And they're having this discussion that we're about to read. So this thing we're reading is the Buddha first presenting, you know, okay, this is where it is. This is what's going on. And then sets the play up, you know, the players of the play up, and then they have a discussion. Uh, so it's in interesting when you look at the sutras, you establish who the actors are, what their role is, uh, and then why they were the ones that it was being spoken to. Uh, and you see the Buddha has this incredible omniscient mind that can cater treatment plans. The Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. Thus have I heard once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagriya at Vulture Peak Mountain together with a great gathering of the Sangha of monks and a great gathering of the Sangha of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi that expresses the Dharma called profound illumination at the same time, Noble Avogadeshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, while practicing the profound Prajaparamita, saw in this way, he saw the five skandhis to be empty of nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to Noble Avogadeshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, how should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita addressed in this way, noble Avogadeshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, said to Venerable Shariputra, O Shariputra, a son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita should see in this way, seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature, form is emptiness, emptiness also is form, emptiness is no other than form, form is no other than emptiness, in the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness, there are no characteristics, there is no birth and no cessation, there is no impurity, no purity there is no decrease and no increase therefore shariputra and emptiness there is no form no feeling no perception no formation no consciousness no eye no ear no nose no tongue no body no mind no appearance no sound no smell no taste no touch no dharmas no eye dot to up to no mind dot to no dot to of dharmas no mind consciousness dot to no ignorance no end of ignorance up to an old age and death no end of old age and death no suffering no origin of suffering no cessation of suffering no path no wisdom no attainment and no non-attainment therefore shariputra since the bodhisattvas have no attainment they abide by means of prajaparamita since there is no obscuration of mind there is no fear they transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana all the buddhas of the three times by means of prajaparamita fully awakened to unsurpassable true complete enlightenment therefore the great mantra prajaparamita the mantra of great insight the unsurpassed mantra the unequaled mantra the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as truth since there is no deception the prajaparamita mantra is said in this way te ata om gate gate paragate parasangate bodhisoha Thus, Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa should train in the profound Prajnaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that Samadhi and praised Noble Avogadeshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, saying, Good, good, O Son and Noble Family. Thus it is, O Son and Noble Family. Thus it is. One should practice the profound Prajnaparamita just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra and Noble Avogadeshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, that whole assembly and the world with its gods, humans, asuras, and Gandharvas, rejoiced and praised the words of the blessed one and now imagine you we all rejoice in this presentation of the nature of reality that so few so few think of all of the beings right now who are alive will ever hear rejoice that you've heard it rejoice that you've brought others to hear it and imagine they're all rejoicing as well it lays so many karmic imprints within our mind. We take each of these moments that we're moving so quickly, we don't even see them. We have so much potential, so much work to do in each moment. 
And what a yogi does is gets better and better at, becomes more efficient at becoming a Buddha because the yogi starts to see each of those moments as a chance to get away from suffering and to move towards Buddhahood, each of those moments. And in Shanti Deva's Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, it says we don't like suffering at all. We, we are disgusted by it. We hate it when we have to suffer. Why then, if we've studied properly, would we ever in any of those moments create non-virtue? If we were able to have enough conscientiousness throughout our day and introspection, and we really believed the basic teaching the Buddha's come to give, not the funk fancy ones, if we really believe the basic teaching the Buddha came to give about karma and its results and the 12 links of dependent origination, Shanti Deva says, why would we ever again create a non-virtue knowing the pain we feel in the present? Why, when we're stuck with a thorn, would we get angry at the thorn? If we really knew that that anger is what made us get stuck with a thorn. We could really, in each moment, have that kind of in conscientiousness, mindfulness, introspection. If we could really be that present, but not present like, duh, I'm in the moment. Present like, this is where I'm trying to go in the future. This is where I've been in the past and this isn't what I want. What can I do in this moment to make it so that I get everything I've ever wanted? And that's the where we get to, where I hope to get to, where I see myself using more moments in a day and I'd see its effectiveness. And this is why I share it, not to sound like, oh, I'm really working with moments, not hours now. It's a perspective that we have this moment, you know, we're moving so quickly, this subtle impermanence we never even pay attention to. We just see gross things happen and we're shocked by it. You know, we see a, you know, like Geshe Dorje Damdu said, if I planted a tree here and then you all came back in 20, you know, and you then you saw it as a little seedling and then you came back and it was a huge tree 20 years later. It didn't just happen half a second before you walked up. It was moving that quickly towards that result all along. It just wasn't, it was just being seen as whatever it was at the time and wasn't, you know, and at that time could mean year intervals to people. And it's been every 64th of a second dying, growing, changing, disintegrating. And this is, if this is what's really going on, those moments that disintegrate and fall off, you know, every cause the result, the cause going away and the result arising are simultaneous. So we have those moments, cause going away, cause going away, cause going away, cause going away. And if those causes that are going away, whatever they're making occur, you know, right? Whatever they're making occur are just going away. If each time they've gone away, they don't go away like our mental, you know, our motivations and stuff, like they just got thrown in the trash. No, 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 no. They were planted in our consciousness. So when you know you're just planting, 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 you start hearing a clock, tick, tick, tick. listen to a clock sometime and think about planting, planting. What am I thinking right now? What am I thinking? Whoa, am I moving my mind towards love? Am I moving my mind towards wisdom? Am I moving my mind towards compassion? Tick, 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 tick. So powerful. This Shanti Deva teaching that Geshe Aga is giving me, I believe because of the blessing of the lineage, because our teachers are, you know, his root teacher is Geshe Gompo, whose root teacher is, is, is Rinpoche. Uh, there's some blessing of the lineage occurring that's, really making things that are so simple that I wouldn't even normally talk about be the most important thing in the world. 
And I just wanted to share that with you. And I, I hope that it's helpful. And maybe you are already realize that and you're saying, duh, I'm listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> Now make a model offering as a request for teaching. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lamas High, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready, a shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious guru. Sanje Jadan Zaji Janan La Janja Bada Danya Jazuji Dagi Chishe Jipe Sonanji Jala Benja Sanje Druba Sho Sanje Jadan Zaji Janan La Janja Bada Danya Jazuji Dagi Chishe Jipe Sonanji Jala Benja Sanje Druba Sho Sanje Jadan Zaji Janan La Janja Bada Danya Jazuji Dagi Chishe Jipe Sonanji Jala Benja Sanje Druba Sho Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha, Gautama, I pay homage. If you are attached to this life, you are not a spiritual practitioner. If you are attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you are attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there is grasping, you do not have the view. That's from Sachin Konganipos. Parting from the Four Attachments. So, hey, everybody, how are you? So we've been looking at the foundation of all good qualities and going back and uh, just kind of like squeezing some of the juice, <laughs> if you will, out of stanzas. And, uh, you know, we were able to, because of this teaching from Umzala Geshe Aga, where Dalai Lama is referencing all these texts and then I'm finding the texts and then I'm finding their relevance uh, to certain sections and I just can't help myself. So... Uh, I've read something I'm going to read to you tonight before, but His Holiness said that there's two texts that he really recommended uh, within this section on impermanence. Uh, and it's each of the texts isn't just about, yeah, things are impermanent, they're momentary, look at how fast they're going. They really invoke a feeling, but not just a feeling of like, oh no, uh, a feeling of, confidence that this is what I should do because of this. And I think that that's so inspiring. So let me start by reading uh, the beginning of the source of all my good. Source of all my good. The source of all my good is my kind Lama, my Lord. Bless me first to see that taking myself to him in the proper way is the very root of the path and grant me then to serve and follow him with all my strength and reverence. We've gone over that a lot. And uh, we know that we need qualified teachers in order to even begin or get anywhere. And just, you know, choosing anyone to teach us and to deal with our minds is quite dangerous. We need to make sure that they know what they're talking about. They've had instructions from qualified people and that they're practicing, you know, unless it's a pro college to academic situation. And you can al always, if you're at my teaching, look at it in that manner. I'm not looking for you to take me on as a guru. <laughs> I'm looking to just know that I had a guru and I, I had a, an incredible teacher that presented me with stuff and then told me to present it to you. So uh, that's what I'm trying to do. And I know that the foundation of everything good I have incontrovertibly in my mind, it doesn't have a doubt in there. Like they say, you realize things, there's a, levels of abandonment. This is the first topic. <laughs> <laughs> of the small scope, but I feel as though I, this is the way my mind works. 
this is it is and my mind worked for this this way for quite some time and i proved it to myself when rinpoche lived with us um and this isn't again bragging it's not bragging i haven't seen emptiness i don't have bodhicitta or renunciation or shamatha but it's saying that if you practice this stuff and you recognize the value of things your mind changes and what you emphasize as the most important thing, the source of all your happiness, will change and become something that actually works. Bless, so Babunka said, Rinpoche says, this is the first section, how to find a Lama and so forth. And then the next is what you do. You know, we're not going to get past what you do tonight because we're only going to be in the small scope section. <laughs> we won't get back, get to the once, you know, the prayers and supplications to have obstacles removed. And then finally, the prayer to be able to reach the state of Vajradhara, the fourth category, Pabunka Rinpoche says, that's what we're aspiring to make happen. You know, and that's the dedication. We're not going to settle for anything less until we're Dorje. We've achieved the state that Vajradhara has achieved. That's the Buddha Shakyamuni in his tantric form. Uh, so then it says, bless me to realize the excellent life of leisure I found just this once is ever so hard to find and ever so valuable. Grant me then to wish and never stop to wish that I could take its essence night and day. So we have this life of leisure and it's so leisurely. <laughs> <laughs> that we have teachers all around us and we can just whatever we want to learn because of the internet we can just we can learn it uh, we we have access to the qual most qualified teachers imaginable we were doing prayers the other you know on last sunday for again jeffrey hopkins and just on pops geshe yeshe topke i mean maha city yeshe topke the mo one of the highest lamas in the world had that much respect for Jeffrey Hopkins to pop on. But then because of technology, we just had sudden access to Maha City, a Maha City, you know, a, a very realized accomplished master in his 90s. I mean, just amazing. You can look him up, Geshe Yeshe Tapke. Uh, he's got lots of videos online and a great translator from Russia. I mean, it, we're so blessed. You just think about what technology affords us. So we've got this life of leisure, but there's a problem with it. So yay, we can do all this stuff. We have all these teachings. We're not in an unfortunate land. We're not a hell being hungry ghost or an animal. We're not a long life God. We have all our senses and stuff. <laughs> Everything's working, but guess what? That's temporary stuff, you know? And, you know, we uh, the Dharma's here. But what about when we die? Are we going to remember our past lives? Are we? Do we know when we die? That's what we got. What we got now. And if we're not sure, we're going to need to get doing something about that, because the next part, you know, it's I have this life that's ever so hard to find and ever so valuable. Grant me then to wish and never stop to wish that I could take its essence night and day. Why would I need to take its essence night and day? Why wouldn't I take a break? That sounds frustrating. That sounds tiresome. Like take its essence. I got to every day do something. Why would I do that? Well, the question I just asked, are you, do you know that in your next life you will have leisure? Will you have the opportunity to study? Do you know this for sure? Rinpoche didn't have a problem because he had matured his mind and others I've talked to who've spent time with lamas and they die, they pass away, go to nirvana, whatever the proper way to say it is. <sighs> whatever their body is there and they're not breathing anymore means <laughs> that the time leading up to that wasn't a problem at all because they knew that they took the essence of the life and knew what was going to happen at death and how to handle it. So you say death, did you? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I have a permanent life or at least permanent until I'm like a hundred, right? Cause you know, and then their science is getting better and better. So shoot, by the time I would be a hundred, I bet you people live to 120. So now I've got a permanent 120 box that I think I'm in. And this is the problem we have. We spend all these years thinking I can do it later. I can do it later. I can do it later because we grasp it ourselves as being permanent. And until we shake that 
And I don't mean shake it like, yeah, I, I know I'm going to pass. And others are really more aware of it. Some are more aware of it than others. I, I, I will give you that. But being aware of it and linking it to effort is what this leisure and opportunity to death and impermanence topic to topic is for. Lama Tsongkhapa is smart. Hey, you're great but you won't always be, do you want to be great again? Or do you want to be great, greatest? Well, then we got to talk because you're going to die. My body and the life in it are fleeting as the bubbles in the sea froth of a wave. Bless me first, the death that will destroy me soon, the, to recall the death that'll destroy me soon. We don't even think about this. We think I'm going to be 120. <laughs> There's a permanent box there. Soon when? I don't know. There's no fixed span here in this southern continent. <laughs> Jambu Viba. There's no fixed lifespan. Could be in 10 minutes. We got to recall that. Recall the death that will destroy me soon. It doesn't mean like soon when I'm 120, it's going to go fast. Doesn't mean it like that. Look how fast life goes. <laughs> That from now to 120 is going to go fast. No, 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 no. Like, destroy me soon, meaning soon, like in 10 minutes, maybe, or when I'm 120. But either way, that's soon in the scheme of beginningless lives and a consciousness that never ends. That's soon. But soon has varied <laughs> interpretations, five minutes or when I'm 120. And we don't really... Think about the five minutes. And Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, when you do, you'll day and night do something about it. So let's say, so then help me find your knowledge that after I've died, the things I've done, the white or black. So everything I do in every moment, the good things and the bad things, that's what I bring with me. So if I don't like suffering now, as Shanti Deva says, why would I engage in anything that is negative in any of those moments? Because I'm bringing it with me and it's going to produce either what I want or what I don't want. Let's be smarter. <laughs> and what those deeds will bring to me, follow always close behind as certain as my shadow. Grant me then, based on this fact, in the moments I have to stop the slightest wrong of the many wrongs we do and try to carry out each and every good of the many that we may. Wow. It's such basic stuff. But when you think about it, what am I trying to do each moment? You know, try to abandon negativity, abandon evil. Engage in perfect virtuous practices. Subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Your mind is the thing that you're checking. When? Every moment. What are you checking? You're trying to be positive. Virtuous qualities and abandon evil. Wow. How could you ever get good enough to check each moment? You'd have to calm your mind down enough and enough and then mix it with emptiness to stop being so unrealistic. Stop being so unrealistic. <laughs> All right, this is a text by Pabunka Rinpoche that I personally love. It's not too long. Uh, it's in the blaze of non-dual bodhicitta offered by the Tibet House New Delhi with this beautiful picture of Buddha Shakyamuni that's the exact size, by the way. Deshi Dorje Damdu made it this way that you would use if you just chose Buddha Shakyamuni as your object of observation for your shamatha. So this image on the front of the book was constructed exactly the way that it was with the size that it was constructed as in order to give you an object of observation to work with that wasn't so detailed with all kinds of robes and, you know, we're just trying to get our mind on one object. Uh, so here's something that is helpful. Uh, everybody has a different thing that they can imagine and it's like, okay, and it should bring faith in your mind and it should inspire you. It says this in Meditation on Emptiness, if you read it, that the object you pick, the thing that's great about the Buddha is it's inspiring and uplifting and you're, you're gathering virtue while you're trying to, trying to get it there, <laughs> to stay there and then to stay there and not be so sleepy, you know, and not be too blissed out that you're missing dullness. I mean, there's a lot to look for. And it's luckily... We have an instruction manual on how to develop shamatha in nine stages <laughs> given to us by many qualified teachers. So this is called the heart spoon. Geshe Dorje Damdu always says we're being spoon fed. Here's a little bit of spoon feeding. <laughs> Encouragement 
through recollecting impermanence. So this is what get Lama Zopa Rinpoche meant, encouragement through recollecting impermanence. This isn't supposed to be dark and dreary and, oh my God, I'm going to sit in a cemetery in bones and disgusting. We're not meditating on ugliness. We're, this is supposed to inspire us to get going. It's inspirational literature. <laughs> and everyone says impermanence and death. But no, no, no. This is inspirational literature. So strange to think of it like this. You think inspirational is, you know, love, and unicorns and clouds and empty openness, lots of openness. That's big. Openness is big. <laughs> Expanse is big. But this is what is so inspiring. Because it says, let's get in gear because not because we're foolish, because we're wise. And there's something can be done that can be done about the problem. If there was nothing to do about the problem, like Shanti Deva says, don't worry about it. If there's something that can be done about the problem, don't worry about it. Something can be done about the problem. <laughs> so this is encouraging to say, wow, we've got this problem, but there's something that can be done about it. Let me really take those moment by moment chances I have to do something. And hopefully we read this and you're like, man, I really want to do it more. That Pabunka Rinpoche, he's a real go-getter. <laughs> yeah. Heart Spoon, Encouragement Through Recollecting Impermanence by Pabunka Rinpoche, Dorje Chang. I added the Dorje Chang. Ah, the hurt. We know what that is. Kind Lama, look to this pitiful one. How I behave and how I've cheated myself my entire life. Please look upon this mindless one with compassion. So it's not saying, it's saying like, I should really want better for myself. Like, oh, wait a second. I've been cheating myself all along. I got a chance to have bliss, reliability, and never suffer again. And I've been just going to get suffering. That was like what I did from the moment that I woke up until went to bed was just got the suffering of suffering or suffering of change banked up in my mind. And the pervasive compounded suffering just banked up in my mind. That's all I've done. When I could have been working towards bliss, that seems stupid. And that's what this is kind of about. Like, you deserve better. Tell yourself that I deserve a lot better than a mess, but it's my mind that is making me feel the way that I do. I can't change external factors. I can change one, you know, a gajillion. I don't know if that's a number. I'm not, I know it's not a gajillion external factors, one mind. What's a better bet? You think you're going to subdue the gajillion or the one? I think anybody intelligent would work on one thing. <laughs> and by working on that one thing, you subdue a gajillion things in your reaction to a gajillion things. Okay, here we go. The essential advice to give yourself heart spoon. So here it's saying like, you should, you know, you should feed yourself this in the morning. When you get up and you think, oh, I have life of leisure and opportunity, take a spoonful of this. Keep it deep within your heart. Don't be distracted. Don't be distracted. Reflect upon the state of your life from the essential drop at your heart, from the very core of your heart, the very core of your mind. Don't let it just be loose and like, yeah, yeah, it sounds pretty good. Let this hit you like a lightning bolt. And sometimes things happen like this. Let it hit you, you know, right to the essential drop at your heart. And this can be explained from the but we're not going to explain it in drops and things like this, but from the essential drop of your heart, your mind, the subtlest part of your mind, put it there. Since beginningless cyclic existence, which has not ended up to now, though you have experienced countless cycles of rebirth, just so many variations on happiness and pain, you've achieved not the slightest benefit from them. Those moments were not used right. You wasted them. And through, though at present you have attained leisure and fortune so difficult to find, 
Always till now, they have finished and been lost, have been empty and without meaning. Now, if you care about yourself, the time has come to practice the essence of future happiness, virtuous actions. If you care about yourself, we talk about, you know, self-compassion is big these days. Well, if you care about yourself, then this is what you should be doing every moment. You appear so capable, smart, and clever, but you're a fool. As long as you cling to the child's play of the appearances of this life, suddenly you're overwhelmed by the fearful Lord of death and without hope or means to endure, there's nothing you can do. This is going to happen to you. Because you think I'm go not going to die for some time, I'm not going to die for some time while you're distracted by the never-ending activities of this life, suddenly the fearful Lord of death arrives announcing, now it's time to die. This is going to happen to you. And Shanti Davis says, this life's tasks will never be finished. You know, so many kings and high lamas pass away before their work's finished. There's going to be something. If you're just going to go, once you, okay, let me just get this task done. Another task will come up. It'll never all be finished. Though you make arrangements saying tomorrow and tomorrow, and then suddenly you have to go, this will happen to you. Don't think you have tomorrow. Today is the day you take the essence of this life. This moment is the moment you take the essence of this life. And without choice, leaving behind in disarray your left work, left food, and drink, you have to depart. This is going to have to happen to you. Bags of sampa left. All we don't we don't didn't eat sampa. Rinpoche did occasionally. But when Rinpoche passed into the non-abiding nirvana again, wherever he went to go help. His sampa was here, left. This has happened. This will happen to you. If it happened to Kensar Geshe Wandok, this will happen to you. What do you have in your cupboard? Think about it. These are the meditations you do. Think about your cupboard. Think about your refrigerator, and then you just die. Think about people cleaning that out. Like, oh, I didn't realize they liked skim milk. <laughs> you know, I thought they were more of a whole milk person. You know, <laughs> just think about that. Someone will be like doing that. That's really like, this is like really the reality. Yeah, I, yeah, I thought I would have sworn they were vegan. Look at this, cheddar cheese in the drawer. <laughs> it's just crazy, right? The way that our minds do our things in our own personal mistaken identity. There's no time other than today to spread your bedding and go off to sleep. Upon your last bed, you fall like an old tree. And others unable to turn you with their lily soft hands, tug at your clothes and blanket. This is going to happen to you. Saw this. Even if you completely wrap, and I know you have too, folks on here. I've seen this many, many times. Even if you completely wrap your body in last under and outer clothes, still you have no freedom to wear them other than just today. And when that body becomes as rigid as earth and stone and you behold for the first time your own corpse, you, this is going to happen to you. Though you struggle to speak your last words, your will and expressions of sorrow pitifully, your tongue dries up and you can't make yourself clear. An intense sadness overwhelms you. You see when someone's pat right before death, their mouth is so dry. They're talking and you can hear the clicking and they can barely get the words out. This will happen to you. Though others put your final food, holy substance and relic, relics with a trickle of water in your mouth, you're unable to swallow even a single drop and it overflows from the corpse's mouth. This is going to happen to you. Though surrounded by a circle of close relatives, heart friends, those near to you, and even though they are loving and distressed at the ending of your being together while crying and clinging, just then you have to separate forever. This is going to happen to you. Though you experience horrific hallucinations like a turbulence of waves and are overcome by unbearable, excruciating pain, pitiful though you may be, there's nothing to be done then. The appearances of this life are setting just like a sun. This is going to happen to you. Though with unbear unbearable compassion, your Lama and Vajra friends plead in your ear for a critical virtuous thought to arrive. Like if we're going to, hope that someone's going to do poa, like we can live a crappy life. And then there's some llama is going to whisper in our ear and eject our consciousness and throw it somewhere great. And even though they do so with loving minds, 
There's no hope. It's unthinkable. Use brains. This is going to happen to you. Don't count on some special blessing because you have some connection to a high lama who's going to show up. That's just not how it works. The Buddha would show up every time someone's dying. Fix it. With an expelled rasping sound at the time of at the time of death, the movement of your breath, uh, the mo movement of your breath builds faster and faster, then breaks like the string of a violin. And at the end of your and at the end of your life has come to its close. And at the end of your life has come to its close. This is going to happen to you. It's like it's string breaking. You know, it's becoming tighter and tighter and tighter. <laughs> And then it is no more. There will be a there will come a time when your cherished and sadly lost lovely body is called a corpse, disgusting and rotten. And at a time when your body, which can't even bear rough bedding and mattress, is laid out on bare ground, this is going to happen to you. There will come a time when your body can't even bear. A, there will come a time when your body, which can't even bear a thorn pricking it now, is chopped to pieces from the bone. Its flesh is torn in a time when your body, which can't stand even fleas and lice, is devoured by birds and dogs till nothing's left. This is going to happen to you. Though you go to so much trouble blowing in the dressing your body, in, in dressing your body in the finest of clothes, there will come a time when that body is placed within a burning house and your body, which can't tolerate even the fire of a glowing stick of incense touching you must be burned in the midst of a fiery conflagration. This is going to happen to you. There will be a time when entering into roaring flames, all your flesh and bone are burned and, and reduced to a pile of ash. And or a time when your body can't even bear even heavy cloth is weighted tight in a hole in the ground. This is going to happen to you. Imagining whoever it is picking up your urn. We went and picked up Rinpoche's urn. Okay. Oh, it's that not thinking this will happen to me. What if I picked that up and thought this will happen to me instead of, oh, Rinpoche would have rather me say this will happen to me. We should see the signs of death and say this will happen to me. When we meditate on this, we think of our relatives going to get this ashes and then we've told them, oh, can you bring them here or there? And now they're like taking your body chopped up, if you will pieces, particles, dust, whatever. And all these pieces, you couldn't even stand a prick. Now you're, you're in pieces, just being scattered by other people around. This will happen to you. There will come a time of the announcing the deceased. Fill in your name. Him or herself, it says, fill in your name. And there's a blank. <gasps> Goes blank, blank, blank. Him or herself, you know, boy or girl, whoever you are, fill in your name. At the beginning and end of your sweet name, this is going to happen to you. Like your name will be the deceased. Your sweet name, your ever so sweet name, Jeff. Jeff, yes, dear. Jeff is deceased. It's just a different feeling that just came to my mind. Then yes, dear, I just heard someone I love, hey. And then my name being called the person who's deceased. It's different feeling in my mind. At a time when the area is filled with sobbing sounds of your affectionate close companions and circle of servants, this is going to happen to you. There will come a time when your clothes, hats, possessions, and livestock will all be divided up with nothing left in the four directions and corners, even your skim milk. And there will become a time when, in total despair alone, you reach the passage to the intermediate state or the between. I like this better. It's Robert Thurman's translation of Bardo, the between. It's better than intermediate. It's not like you're, you're a medium level person. No, 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 no. You're in the middle of something. You're between something, between lives. So I'm going to try to use that now. And you try to catch me. <laughs> this is going to happen to you. The terrors of the four fearful enemies descending upon you going to come. The appearance of being trapped under a mountain packed with rock and rubble and buried beneath a furious avalanche of earth. What to do? The appearance of being set adrift on the surface of a vast sea carried away by violent swirling waves. What to do? literally says that what to do and the experience of your heart and ears being split open by the sizzling and cracking sounds of a fiery conflagration what to do 
the fearful experience of being enveloped and swept away by the swirling dark winds of the end of an eon. What to do when you are driven by the powerful red winds of karma and swallowed by up by a terrifying darkness? What to do when you're bound with a lasso by the messengers of Yama and in total despair are led away? What to do when you're tortured in so many de detestable ways by ox and scorpions headed, ox and scorpion headed karmic agents? What to do? When you are before the Yama King, the Lord of Death, as he weighs up the white and blacks, your virtuous and non-virtuous actions, what to do? When the Yama exposes your lie of having spent your whole, whole human life in attachment, hatred, and deceit, what to do? When the time of death comes and all you've brought with you, the white or black are black things that are attachment, hatred, and deceit. When death comes, what to do then? nothing but just get thrust into another mess which probably won't be anywhere near this good when ayama's court the punishment that is the ripening effect of your negative actions is meted out what to do when your naked body is stretched out on the glowing red hot iron ground in the fires of hell what to do through your body though your body is cut in pieces by a rain of weapons still you experience it without dying, what to do? Imagine if you could experience these kinds of sufferings because of bad actions, because of habituation with negativity. Imagine if it's possible, what would you do? Though you are cooked in molten iron until your flesh falls away and your bones disintegrate, still you must experience it without dying. He's talking about the hell realms. Uh, and these, think about states of mind that could just are negative, that if they were flipped to concordant results that were really nasty. Now this could be, it's a mental state as Aga was saying, you know, at, we see it, a mental state creates everything. A mental state makes a dog think that the thing is a, a chew toy and not a shoe. It's just a difference in a mental state. Couldn't we shift even a little further than the dog? And then there could be something that's real bad. We see animals that have like, Close to this, I've boiled lobsters when I was younger. Though you are cooked in molten iron until your flesh falls away and your bones disintegrate, still you must experience it without dying, what to do? Though your body and fire burn inseparably, still you experience it without dying, what to do? When your body is cracked by a freezing cold wind and cracks into a hundred pieces, what to do? Having fallen into the miserable state of a hungry ghost with its hunger and thirst, you have to starve for many years, what to do? When you have to become one of those stupid, unfortunate, dumb animals that eat, you, eat each other alive, what to do? And then if you, Aga said, go watch Animal Planet. He said, watch when the tiger takes a bite out of the gazelle or whatever it is they chase. And look at the tiger's anger, that state of mind. And then look at the gazelle turn back angry or whatever, you know, they try to get away or they're angry. You see how hard it is to get out of that realm. We think about projecting karma at the time of death. We think about the animal realm eating each other alive constantly. Wow. When the unbearable sufferings of the evil gone realms have actually befallen you, it's not just something you read about and talk about and, well, and there's six, uh, eight hot hells and eight cold and surrounding when they're actually occurring in your life or there's worms in the ground that the robins just pluck out. When that's actually occurring in your life, what to do? Now, don't be distracted. Laura, Laura. Right this moment is the time to steal your will. It's not only time, it's almost too late. Right now, right now. Laura, Laura, great force, apply yourself with it. Apply yourself with great force. Holy precept of the Lama, kind father, part of the authoritative scriptures of the victorious Lozong, Lama Tsongkhapa, practice of the pure path of complete sutra and tantra. It's time to place real experience upon your mind stream. Like, let's get real. Let's get down to business. You want to have realizations? Let's do it because they can happen. Who's the faster? Death, Yama, or you and your practice of realizing the essence of your internal dream. The race is on. The welfare of both yourself and others as much as you can each day. 
unifying the three doors of your body, speech, and mind, put the whole of your effort into practice. Who's faster, death or you in your practice of realizing the essence of your internal dream? Thank you so much, everybody, for allowing me to do this. We'll uh, end there. Who's faster? Those moments, you practice in those moments? Our death will come and nothing can stop it. We're always moving closer to it. No time to practice dharma. We don't know when we're going to die. Life's always being subtracted from and never added to. This body's pretty weak. Concluding mandala offering and dedication prayer. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. I dedicate whatever virtues I have collected for the benefit of the teachings and of all sentient beings, and in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Ozandrapa to shine forever. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious guru. Thank you so much. And any mistakes that I may have made out of error uh, because of my own ignorance, not because of a wish to deceive, may they be purified by this mantra. And may we see Vajrasapha is inseparable from our Lama, seeing Namgyal Kensar Geshe Wandak Rinpoche, inseparable from the deity, inseparable from Tara herself. We're so fortunate to have such a kind Lama who expressed all of the stages of the path to enlightenment that are necessary for us to mature our minds, for our Buddha nature to actually go from just a seed of perfection to grow into the actual state of Buddhahood where we have all of the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience removed because we've separated them from a consciousness that's in the nature of clear light and then unsullied. And it's empty of inherent existence and doesn't just abide in this stuck state of broken that it is right now. It can mature because we have good qualities that can be matured and that can be made greater and greater and greater and bad qualities that can be removed more and more and more by engaging in practices that help us abandon the self-grasping ignorance and the self-cherishing attitude. Om benzo sato samaya mena balaya benzo sato zeno vajita dita me vazu dukai me vazu bukai me vano ragni me vazu avazi ni me braja zava kama suji me kijam shiyan kuru hum ha baga vanzo vata da kata benzo mama me muka benzo baba ma samaya sapa ah um e may we always be protected by Paul and Lama may we always connect with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Jo Rama Jo Rama Jo Jo Rama Tunjo Kala Raja Mo Rama Vaja Daja Tunjo Rudo Rudo Hon Jo Hon. Now concluding prayers, uh, dedication prayer. I have it here. My book broke, as you know. That's a good sign when your book breaks. It means that you've used it. <laughs> I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well as whatever dedication is praised the supreme by all the conquerors to traverse the three times I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds Long life prayer for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. May we have no obstacles in our minds to being able to meet with His Holiness in all of our lives, to have Him walk up to us completely healthy because we don't have any obstacles. And may we always be guided by the Buddha of compassion, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Chen Rezig in person, our true wish-fulfilling jewel. And all sentient beings need our Buddhas. When we look at the fulfillment of everyone's needs, we see every time a Buddha, someone becomes a Buddha, all sentient beings' needs are fulfilled because all we need are Buddhas who can show us how to get rid of our afflictive obstructions and obstructions to omniscience so that we can then become the most reliable guides, the teacher, sugata, and protectors. I pray for the long life. I, I and Wow, I almost... 
in that pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness. All powerful Abul Kateshvara, Tenzin Yatso, may you stay until samsara's end. Rong ri ra we go we jin yon dear ben don de wa ma lu jong we ne jen re zi wan den zin ya zo yi ja be zi de ba du den yo and pray for the long life of Venerable Geshe Dorje Damdula, Venerable Umzala, Geshe Aga, so kind to teach Shanti Deva's guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life almost every day. So, so fortunate. Pray that we can unite with Geshe Lobsang Gompo again. He was such a pure, pure teacher and really opened the door to my ability to analyze things. I feel so fortunate to be able to have really really had him in my life and i the prayer of supplication i don't uh for rinpoche um i don't have but may we meet with ken sergeshe wandak rinpoche in all of our future lives rinpoche who's inseparable from Aryatara. we offer him bathing water drinking water flowers incense candles scented water food music, purified by Oma Hom, Oma Hom. And may we recognize that we must practice the teachings as he encouraged us to and recognize that the Buddha does not wash away the negativities of beings, nor does he remove their suffering by his hands. His spiritual realizations are not transferred to them. It's by teaching the truth of suchness that beings are liberated. And hopefully we will one day realize who Rinpoche really was. When we realize renunciation, bodhicitta and the correct view of emptiness we're so fortunate that kensar geshe wandak like atisha brought this teaching here to the west like atisha brought the pure teaching to tibet i feel like rinpoche did this for us and was so kind to teach us in our own individual capacities and it was so effective and if we practice every day what rinpoche taught us what his holiness the dalai lama teaches us the nalanda pandits taught us buddha shakyamuni at the final say and things taught us, then our minds will mature and we'll be able to achieve Buddhahood because we all have Buddha nature and we should stop settling for something that isn't the best because we do every day. We settle for suffering of suffering, suffering of change. We think the suffering of change is happiness. We settle for that when we could have a happiness that never changed. All right, see you later. Have a great week, everybody. I appreciate you watching.